Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, um, I'm absolutely honored to have such a distinguished chairperson and, and, and such, a, such a remarkable distinguished panel, and all of you uh, who are so deeply interested in governance and democracy and electoral reforms, and of course, a whole range of other, other very important issues. Kuleshi uh, Saab spoke of so many strengths of Indian democracy. Uh, can I add one more? You can disagree very, very severely and still come together for one cause, which is the cause of democracy. Uh, that's the strength. That's the strength of our, our democracy. And frankly, if you didn't disagree, democracy would be pretty meaningless. Uh, we know a lot of places where people don't disagree. Uh, but those are not places that we associate with democracy. <coughs> Let me first give you the good news. And the good news is that um, the whole government, the Prime Minister and I personally, um, are absolutely committed to the reform process that has already gone very far. Enormous amount of consultations have taken place. Stakeholders are on board. And uh, all, uh, most if not all the recommendations that have been made very, very vigorously are recommendations that we will take through, I hope, very, very quickly. What we need is uh, a process by which all the parties can be brought on board. Um, and we did hope uh, that we would have the consultation, all party consultation, uh, at the end of last year and then the beginning of, beginning of this year. Uh, but the all party consultations on uh, what is equally an important uh, mission, uh, which is to find uh, a, a new institutions, institution and empower a new institution to enforce accountability uh, on people who hold high public office uh, is something that has preoccupied, preoccupied the attention both of parliament and of political parties. So um, I hope that, uh, that uh, it will not be too long uh, in waiting and uh, we can certainly uh, uh, bring it soon. Uh, we are ready. Uh, the legislative process is, is ready. We might have to do some fine tuning depending on what others actually say as part of the, the uh, consultation. But uh, uh, it's important and I, I want to say uh, on this occasion, I want to acknowledge the debt that we owe to the Election Commission for the uh, guidance, uh, for the inspiration, and uh, the urgings that we have received periodically to take uh, our process, uh, the election process forward. So I think that there should be absolutely no misgivings, doubts, or hesitations into accepting <coughs> that in not too distant future we will be bringing this legislation to Parliament. We've not been idle. We have brought a spate of and a slew of legislation proposals that are absolutely far-reaching. The procurement bill, for instance, some people still think it could be strengthened further. The whistleblowers protection bill, for instance, the judicial standards and accountability, accountability bill, the citizens charter, the citizens charter, uh, um, important, important changes uh, that are being made in, in the IPC, in the criminal procedure, criminal procedure code, important changes that will also be made Prevention of Corruption Act um, as a consequence of the legislation that we bring for the Lokpal and uh, similarly uh, many other important legislations. And it is not to say that because we are doing those we will put electoral reforms uh, on the back burner. Electoral reforms are part of, of that, that bundle of entitlements that we are giving to the citizen of our country uh, because uh, this is uh, absolutely a uh, primary commitment and a primary responsibility that this government owes to the people that have put it in, in power. So let's get that absolutely clear. Now uh, let me just throw at you some provocative ideas for the simple reason that we are not here just to lobby for a good idea that we all believe in, cherish and that we are committed to. We are also here as thinking people and uh, I don't have any answer and I don't expect that there will be answers, but maybe other panelists will respond to these, <coughs> these questions. There are difficult uh, issues that have been flagged, paid news. It's a difficult area. I hope that there is, uh, we find some solution. Um, excluding criminals from the electoral process, again a difficult, difficult idea. 
um, because of the implications, etc., of misuse. I think we've got a formulation that is possibly workable, and that's the formulation that we will try to bring, bring to Parliament. Uh, there may be similarly other issues, but I think the issue of today's discussion, which is funding, the funding of the electoral process is very critical, and uh, regrettably, none of us have very clear answers answers to the issue of funding of, of the electoral process. A lot of, lot of vigilance was put into the election governance last time, and I think it's, uh, there may have been some disquiet and inconvenience caused to ordinary people, uh, but I think overall for, for a good cause, I don't think ultimately anybody can complain. But the provocative ideas that I want to place before you are ideas on which I frankly have no answer because I'm not an economist. Uh, and I, I, I don't know what uh, uh, Nainan can possibly add in further response. The problem about funding of elections is not that we make an exception of good behavior uh, when elections come. The problem of funding of elections is that there is money that we use for all kinds of purposes in this country that is unaccounted for. There is a parallel economy in the country. Now, to tell all Indians that can you please not use the parallel economy in an election is not going to be very persuasive. Is there a way in which the parallel economy itself can be controlled? Um, I think if the parallel economy can be controlled, and I'm not saying that we've done nothing in the last 30 years to control the parallel economy. There are many, many, many instruments that have been used periodically one instrument that was, was used, for instance, was voluntary declaration. Um, that was one instrument. Another instrument that was used to use the stick, to actually go and drive to people's homes and use the stick on them and say that, look, uh, we will treat you in the marketplace if you have uh, money hoarded in your, uh, uh, under, under your bed. Uh, there was also an instrument by, by which uh, we said that uh, they, you will get less taxes to pay because you are probably stashing money away because you're having to pay very high taxes. So we will drop the, the general tax level so that more people are willing. We will give you better exemptions. We will give you uh, better entitlements. There will be there will be no uh, no uh, um, tax upon upon uh, inherent inher inheritance tax, etc., etc., and so on. Many kind of instruments were used, and I, I'm sure that some of you prefer one over the other, some of you believe one was more successful than the other, but we still remain, we still remain uh, haunted by the presence of this ghost of black money. And people say to us as a government, why don't you bring the money back, the money that is abroad? Uh, well, we can't send the army to bring it back. Uh, we have to bring it back through agreement, through incentives, through persuasion, uh, through a degree of, of, uh, of uh, perhaps sanctions, uh, if those sanctions are going to work. Uh, but that money wouldn't be there in the first place if there wasn't any black money to stash away. If you have money, you're going to put it away somewhere. And you will put it away somewhere which is, which is uh, secure and comfortable. But if there wasn't black money, it wouldn't happen. So if there wasn't black money, it wouldn't go to, to banks abroad. If there wasn't black money, it wouldn't be used in elections. What is it that we can do to ensure that there is no black money? The second issue, the second issue is, is that there are many, many things that we do in our life, in our, in our everyday life in this country, that we are not supposed to do election time. Uh, now, uh, it's difficult, but it's been observed, and I'm, I'm glad that it's been observed. Uh, you have to switch off mics at 10 o'clock, election time. But you don't switch off elect your mics at 10 o'clock at weddings. Uh, because we do believe in this country in taking uh, advantage of what we are and uh, making life inconvenient for our neighbors or making life inconvenient. How do we drive on the road? Uh, the way we drove on the roads of Delhi during, during the Commonwealth Games is not the way we drive on the roads of Delhi all the time. Uh, an election right, is like a Commonwealth Games. One week you drive in your lane. And once you stop, uh, elections are over, you go back to any lane in which you want to drive. Can we uh, just have elections more often so that we can uh, <laughs> behave better all the time? 
and uh, we'll have elections so often that non-election time we'll forget that you're supposed to you're supposed to break all the rules. I think this is this is a larger issue in our country. How can we stop putting posters all the time and defacing walls all the time, rather than only during the time of elections? It's the same municipalities that come into play, the same municipality that refuse to give you permission, the same municipality that that uh, that have to answer to the election commission if they allow you to put your poster and your billboards everywhere. Similarly, it's the same police that enforces during the time of an election, which doesn't enforce the law when the elections are not in operation. So I think this is a larger question that we have to answer. Now, I can't give you an economic answer, but I can give you an instinctive answer that I have, and I don't know if the Election Commission has more data on this. Uh, is, it, is it that black money plays a bigger role in first past the post? and would, would uh, play a lesser role if you had, if you had the list system and if you, had, if you had a proportional representation system. If individuals didn't have to win their own elections and if individuals didn't have to buy favors for themselves, would we be better off that the use of black money would be restricted and you would be able to control and check and audit black money or whatever money at one point because the party would be funding the entire operation. No individual would be concerned about winning the election himself or herself. Will the proportional representation system work in this country? Uh, is it true that wherever there is proportional representation, there is less corruption in the election process than there is in even in England, where there is a first past the post system? I think this is a fundamental question that we want to examine. I'm not saying this as a minister today, I'm saying this as a participant in an enlightened debate on how to go forward and have next generation. This generation reforms I'm committed to, I will deliver. The next generation reforms will have to be greater ones. And I'm going to now throw a very, very provocative idea, which is how many democracies in the world do we follow elections for and find that there is a very explicit presence of an election commission? Why isn't there a presence of an election commission when a presidential election takes place in America? Why isn't there is an explicit presence of an election commission when an election takes place in UK? Why, doesn't, why isn't there an explicit... Are we as a people, are we as a people uh, in, in need of regulation that must be not just regulation that is in place, but must be seen to be in place. Now that's a very, very significant thing. Somebody once told me about security issues in this country. Somebody said that security in our country, but this is again at least 15 years old now, security in our country is not about having somebody who can prevent damage to a VIP. It's only about having a lot of policemen hanging around that give an impression that the person is very secure. You don't have to secure him, you only have to show that he is secure because a large number of people, even if they are with Latis, are standing around him. Now that is not the theme that we apply today for security in the world. You have to be invisible in order to secure. You have to be visible in order to be secure. Now, regulation also, not just in the field of elections, but in any field whatsoever in this country, is the regulation effective and possible if it's visible or is the regulation effective and possible if it is invisible? Will we in the second or third generation of reforms talk about regulation that becomes less visible but it is actually present in the substrata and the DNA of our system so that things happen automatically? Perhaps in the first point that I made is how do we behave outside election time uh, is that something to do with the changing of our DNA, the way, as I say, explicit, explicit, visible regulation, is that better or an implicit, invisible regulation is better? The point is, the regulation has to have a role. We all know in this country that we have moved away from times of control to times of regulation. And we all know that there is a very, very, very significant difference between control and regulation. But are we going to move from regulation to automaticity of conduct, behavior, and things happening? Or do we need to enhance regulation further? I think this is important because it will depend on how
the future generation of election commission will put, make a vision for themselves as to what will be our role, how big will we be, what will be our presence, will our presence require many more good officers on deputation coming permanently or being with the election commission on permanent assignments, will people coming from the IRS or people coming who are sociologists or people coming who are town planners or people who are coming, coming who are from any other field. I think that we need to have a 20, uh, 20 instances we have uh, a 20, a 20 month uh, vision for what reforms in this generation we have to put in and on which, as I said, we have a fairly wide area of agreement and consensus, certainly amongst the stakeholders who came to the conferences, and I hope that that will be reflected also in the response of political parties when we consult, consult with them. I agree that uh, we shouldn't be too finicky. I think I agree that we shouldn't be looking for excuses of consensus. Uh, we sometimes do push legislation through without consensus, so uh, I, I would be very happy to, to push it through even if there isn't a perfect consensus, but a consensus in a matter of election reform, uh, electoral reform, would be a good thing. It would send a strong message that the whole nation together supports these changes, and these changes are not really changes that only one segment or one political party is committed to for one reason or another reason. Now talking about how, how the best intentions of any one of us, whether the, it's the government or it's MPs or it's the election commission or it's the voter or it's the stakeholder, how the best intentions are the, the genius of the Indian mind. And I think you just mentioned, you just mentioned some of them, how, how uh, uh, traders, how traders are, are, are able to balance their books, how, uh, how monies are paid in advance to be taken back, and how mundans take place. I'm surprised that you didn't say that they have now reached the level of producing corpses and saying, this is the death of a person in my family, so you all have to come and have a vote. But, uh, and then you touch the corpse to see whether they will actually wake up on the nudging of uh, income tax officer and then run, run for life uh, again. But uh, one of the things that they seem to have done, uh, and that's interesting, is that even before, in our social system, we were able to provide direct cash transfers. In the election system, they already brought in direct cash transfers. Uh, and that's uh, uh, something that, of course, through the newspapers, as you said, that some model was used. But direct track, track transfer is becoming an issue. And I do want to urge the election commission to, to uh, pay heed to this. The election commission, I've heard uh, Qureshi Saab say in the past, that you people keep asking for raising the limit of expenditure, but the returns that I have shown all show that every candidate has spent less than half the amount that, that, is, uh, that he's entitled to. So I should actually be reducing the total expenditure that you're allowed rather than increasing the total expenditure. Now, frankly, uh, can I be honest? And I say that uh, they don't show their entire expenditure. I didn't say I don't show. I said they don't show. Uh, I, this, they don't show the entire expenditure. And sometimes they don't show the entire expenditure because their fear is that if we show the entire expenditure and there is something we've forgotten and that's technically found to be a, a flaw, uh, then my whole election will be set aside because of that one little flaw. That uh, famous uh, case of <coughs> Mr. Chawla, that uh, something that I don't show and I've shown right up to the edge of the expenditure and then somebody says you didn't show this and that becomes a problem. But I think these are teething problems that, that can be resolved and will be, re will be resolved. Uh, my own view is that uh, a lot of the problems that arise, arise because individuals are desperate to win elections and individuals find that uh, they, they must spend more money in order to win elections. It's a sad thing that I want to share with you. I'm sure you don't, uh, you don't uh, share this proclivity. But the sad thing is that with the, with the decline of ideology in political parties, Political workers and voters are beginning to aspire to direct cash transfers. Money is beginning to play a major role because ideology has taken a back seat. Otherwise, people used to work because they were committed to an ideology and a framework of political thinking. A lot of that has gone. A lot of that has gone. And it's being substituted by easily, easily available, available money. 
But that's a, it's a matter of concern for all of us, all of us who want our elections to be wholesome, elections to be truly, truly representative, elections not to be distorted by induction of, of those elements that uh, take you away from real choice and your real preference and force the choice upon you. But talking about, uh, about institutional response to the role of money, I, I, uh, I cannot resist mentioning that there's an American Supreme Court judgment. And a lot of people in America were disappointed. American the Supreme Court judgment about the kind of money that can be spent in a presidential election by corporates. Uh, and the American Supreme Court, against the liberal view, that it should not be allowed. The American Supreme Court has relied heavily upon instruments of democracy to say that you cannot curtail the choice of corporates in spending money for candidates that they want to support. Um, now, institutions that value democracy uh, sometimes come up with decisions that you have instinctively and we have instinctively felt here is uh, our aspects and dimensions that distort democracy. But I'm really very, very glad that uh, we've gathered here uh, for this very, very important, important matter. Uh, I was intending to proceed with that legislation, but I don't mind giving credit to you, now that we've all had it. I don't mind, uh, and uh, when I make my speech in Parliament, I would say the tilting moment, the tilting point, was uh, meeting with Mr. Bharat Waklu, who gathered some very good people to say, let's move on with democracy and let's move on with electoral reform. Thank you very much.